Good afternoon, everybody. This is Parag Matawar. I'm the Director of Professional Programs at the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. Can I get a thumbs up from, just from somebody to make sure that I've got the right? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Jessica. You knew exactly what I was going to ask. Can you see my the correct monitor? Well, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we'll introduce you to who we are and what we do. For those of you who are joining us for the umpteenth time, you're going to hear the same spiel again, so my apologies. But uh, we at SACE, uh, the professional side of SACE, our mission is to unlock the leadership potential of Asian professionals because the problem that we have is that we, as a community, are 50% less likely to be promoted to middle management than our non uh, than our Caucasian counterparts and our white counterparts. Uh, and the reason... Uh, as we see it, is fourfold. Uh, four common challenges, it doesn't mean everybody, but common challenges within our community are the lack of political and organizational savvy, uh, cultural deference to authority, and ineffective communication and influencing skills, as well as an aversion to risk-taking. Now, these aren't bad things or these aren't right things or wrong things. They're just different things. Cultural context within leadership behaviors varies, not just across company, countries, but also within companies and departments and even within the good old U.S. where, we're, where most of us are. Uh, it's just adaptation. Now, uh, with that knowledge, we do have some challenges to even figure out how to tackle this uh, problem. One is awareness. You know, with the model minority myth and being as persistent as it is, many of us, even in our own community, believe, hey, we're doing just fine. Uh, when in reality, if you peel the onion a few times, you can see, hey, there's some opportunity here as well that would benefit not just us, but also the organizations that we are employed by. Uh, number two is what to do about it. I know when I was in the corporate space, we often just, it was a little bit more of a one size fits all. Uh, but what I've seen personally and what many who have engaged with us uh, experience is that the cultural context is incredibly important to be able to land. We tend to be more skeptical about leadership training to begin with as a community because we've been, in many cases, just taught, put your head down and get as much work done as possible and success and riches and fortune will follow your way. But that doesn't always happen. So last thing, reality is our numbers. Our numbers don't overall don't end up attracting the attention that that we feel like it, it should. The opportunity is there. The ROI potential is there. Uh, but the reality is we're just often a low priority. And so with that, uh, we've developed a solution where we partner with over 100 companies and over 250 ERG leaders and well over 200 Asian senior executives as well uh, to create a suite of programs. Uh, our national convention is a big one. I'll share a little bit about that at the very end. But we've also got year-round programs like this webinar series. So it's a free series. We do this not only out of the goodness of our hearts, in part, but uh, also because, you know, a lot of our training partners, like like Alok today, love to get in, out in front of folks. Uh, and we recognize that there's opportunity with dripping content throughout the year uh, just to keep our mindsets on, on this type of stuff. Uh, so we feature conversations on relevant topics with our training partners about once a month. Recordings are on the website, so you can always go back and look and see what we did before. Or if you missed something today and you want to catch up and see it again, it'll be on our website. And follow us on LinkedIn uh, is the easiest way to stay abreast of what we're doing. So with that logistics, uh, as I bring up our training partners today, uh, they'll do a brief presentation uh, and then we'll just be doing Q&A. So I want you to shoot any questions you have right into the chat. Uh, Alok and I have an agreement that I am allowed to interrupt him as much as I want. Um, <laughs> but this is a casual conversation. I like to call it a video podcast. It is a conversation. And quite honestly, we know that a lot of you are doing multiple things and that's okay. You know, so Alok's going to talk about the 70-20-10 framework. I met Alok at uh, at a conference last, last summer. Uh, he caught me in the elevator and he, uh, he asked me, you know, that dreaded question, what do you do? <laughs> it's that elevator pitch and i don't know what i said but apparently it was memorable enough that he uh, reached back out so and I, I appreciate that uh, so we were talking about how to engage and we have him coming we have him at our conference coming up as well and he agreed to do this webinar for us he comes to us with a long history from the corporate space uh, uh you know in the l d space as well learning development space as well so uh let me just go ahead and hand it over to him i will stop sharing and a look Take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Parag. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. 
and to present. And Prague, uh, you obviously said something really great. You hooked me in that elevator with your fantastic elevator pitch, uh, which is another fantastic uh, content that we that can be discussed discuss at a later time. So before we jump in to what I want to bring to everyone here, I hope that everyone and their loved ones are safe and sound in the Carolinas and Florida, both Buffalo, New York, uh, just watching things that are that are unraveling. So I hope everyone's safe and their loved ones are safe as well. So, so let me just jump right into it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what we're doing today is, as Prague mentioned, is going to be the 70-20-10 framework. Um, <clears throat> hopefully everyone has already seen a bit about me, about the facilitator, long line of uh, big corporate experience. I did uh, create and write a business plan in high school of my own, a consumer retail uh, business, which which uh, 12 years was a fantastic run. I was not prepared for the for the dot com, uh, but it's OK. I learned a lot. Uh, then moving into pharma, uh, also Deloitte guy. So I have a lot of experience, a lot of learning experiences. And one of the things that that I always asked myself was, is a leader made or born? And I would love to be able to have you um, have a, Jess is going to throw a poll up, is what do you think? Are leaders made, born, or both? Let's see, we've got about over 50% answered already. This is going fast. Super okay. simple. 70%. Let's see if it, uh, let's see if it drops off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No Five, four, three, two, one. All righty. Here we go. A look. Great. So can everyone see the results? I, I just wanted to confirm. This is this is amazing. And what research has found. So here we see just by polling close to 50 percent made close to another 50% equal and 4% born. So, okay, so that's great. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that. And this is this actually came out of a research by CCL, if everyone is familiar with CCL uh, for a corporate uh, center of learning. And what they found is that they had interviewed and polled over 300 executives uh, in different countries. And what they found is, is that half considered it made just like we just answered here and equal was 29% from these global leaders. So not too far off, not too far off. And one of the conclusions that came out of this, and by the way, in the right bottom right hand corner is a QR code. You feel free to bring that up if you like at a later time, you know, shoot your camera to that. And one of the, uh, one of the examples that came out was from Justice Scalia who said, you know, if I had known that my clerk went to Ohio, I would never have hired that clerk. So it is really important that what he was saying is that experience is what really pushed that uh, that circuit court appeals into his favor. So Justice Scalia hired him. And so that's really important because where that comes into play is, because while we're here today, is the 70-20-10. So whenever we talk about development, now here you'll see it's it's the inverse uh, where it goes 10, 20, 70. The 70, 20, 10 means, hey, in your job, you're going to learn and you're going to experience of all the learning you're going to have, 70% is going to come from your job, on the job experience. And I'm sure some of you are probably thinking like, yeah, you know, I do get a lot of that. 20%, not, not a lot of people know this, but 20% are going to come from other people by way of mentoring, coaching. That's really important. And then 10% is going to be your courses, whether it's e-learning, micro-learning, face-to-face learning. Uh, you know, I have uh, extensive leadership development experience, top-rated facilitator. And, and I say that without patting myself on the back, but I love what I do. And that is from the 10%. Now, another, another uh, finding from this, from this experiment and even from the survey is that these leaders felt from different countries, okay, well, fine. We feel that 50% are made and 30% are both and maybe 10% or 20% are born that way. I think it was 4%. But now if you look at it from a cultural perspective, the way that these experiences come into play is if you look at the top left, I'm only starting from the top left, but United States, 
the top two leading indicators from the experiences we learn from our mistakes. And I say we because I'm a U.S. citizen. We learn from our mistakes. And we tend to have some ethical dilemmas, which right or wrong, that's what we feel helps to develop and shape us. But now if you go across from left to right, if you're if you're a leader in India, the way you the way that they had answered this was personal experiences, but also crossing cultures. If you're based in India, you grew up in India and you're a leader from India, you they're feeling that crossing cultures is just as important as any other skill or experiences. Now, if you go to Singapore, for them, for the leaders based there, it's about stakeholder engagements. It's also dealing with crisis. And then China on the top right, it's just like India, personal experiences. However, just like United States, learning from mistakes, learning from mistakes. Let me pause, Parag, in case you have any questions that might have already come your way. And if not, not nobody's put anything in here, but I think that's really fascinating about the mistakes piece, because we often think about Asians as being risk averse. Right. And and uh, uh, and I know it, saying Asian is a little bit of a misnomer because it's so freaking massive. Right. But uh, we often think about as a community being very risk averse, which I've always tied to being fear of making mistakes. Um uh, like a deep fear of making mistakes for because of the uh, the association with shame, right? Sure. Uh, bringing shame onto your family or bringing shame onto your your company, your your work family or whatnot. So, uh, but this is super interesting to me that the mistakes piece is, shows up in both the U.S. and China. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's absolutely interesting. It doesn't surprise me uh, that mistakes. You know, if you're going to be a great leader, a great leader allows their team a little bit of space to make decisions. But what makes a great leader even a better leader is that allows them to make mistakes and learn from mistakes. And we, we hear it. We hear it all the time. And as Asians, we tend, we try to avoid making mistakes. But if you really think about it, that's how we learn. That's how we learn from, from childhood. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the 702010 model. I'm um, going to look at it a little bit differently. Because, you know, uh, depending on how you learn visually or, or by, by word, now what if we looked at the 70-20 model in terms of a ramp? So again, we got the 10% on the left-hand side, and that's what we're learning in classroom, uh, workshops, webinars. And then in the middle, it's, it's basically from mentoring, coaching, feedback. And the right-hand side is the experience. Now, if you really just think, if you sit back and now, hey, the 70-20-10 looks like this, but what if? we start to look at workshops, webinars, learning, and even the, even the community of practice where each of those methods of learning has a 70, 20, 10 built inside of each one. So if, if, if you think about it, is that possible? It's absolutely possible. And we're not gonna touch the action learning because that's pretty, that's pretty much self-evident, you know, self-described, that if it's action learning, that's going to be predominantly learning from your experience on the job. So to rephrase it, on the far left, workshops, webinars, online, e-learning, m-learning, or micro-learning, and then you've got the community of practice, each one of those has a 70-20-10 built in. So let's go to another poll. Love to hear from everyone uh, who's joining us today. Which ways of learning are you most familiar with? This is multiple choice, I believe. So you can. Okay, great. Multiples, yeah. Yeah, great. So we've got about 25%, 33%. Let's get this up to 70-ish, 50. It's adding up really quick, Prague. I love it. It is. It is. Let's... I love it. Uh, all right, we're going to close it in five, four, three, two, one. All righty, let's see what we got here. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? So um, it good thing is everyone's familiar with blended micro learning. You know, micro learning had its little peak a few years ago. It started to drop off a little bit. Community of practice, fantastic. You're you're bouncing ideas off of each other. If you're a facilitator or a learner, action learning, action is doing. That, that's fantastic to hear that uh, 74% because it is multiple choice and then experimental learning. Yeah. Another great 
um, stat from that. And, and as I mentioned the slide before, is we're now going to explore and look at each type of learning. And, and again, Prague, as you receive uh, questions, you know, feel free to throw them out to me. Uh, blended learning. Remember, blended learning was in that 10 percent in the, in the original slide a few slides ago, where part of the 70-20-10, blended learning is in 10 percent. But now if you look at the blended learning from a 70-20-10 format, it just gives you a different dimension. So blended learning includes all the hands-on activities. It includes simulations, uh, allows you, the learner, to really apply your knowledge. And this is really important because it doesn't stop there. There's also a social aspect of it, the 20%. You're able to have group discussions with each other. You're able to have peer reviews with each other and going through the learning interactions. And then 10%, of course, is the um, online courses. You've got the instructional videos. Uh, formal education, and that's for the blended learning. Now, some of these are going to be duplicative. So when we go to micro learning, which is almost the same thing as blended learning, with micro learning, you're going to have the really quick practical task and the challenges. Um, it really allows you to put an immediate application to what you've learned. Same thing with micro learning um, as prior, where you have the social aspect of it. You can have the peer-to-peer -peer learning. You're going to have the ability to have that social interaction and facilitating any of the learnings that you have, and then the the formal front as just like prior. Now you've now you're starting to have some instructional videos. Now you've got some formal education that are really being thrown at you um, in bits and chunks. Let me pause if, if there's any questions, Prag. If you have any thoughts on, yes. on you so far, I appreciate that. Uh, so. Yeah. The reason to break it down further is just because even within the categories, there are different ways of just splitting up. Is there, is there something specific about the 70-20 versus 10 that uh, we should be thinking about from a model standpoint, or is it just uh, different ways to divvy it up? Uh, help me piece that together yeah, a little bit cleaner. Absolutely. So uh, when, when we look at the original 70-20-10 model, 70% comes from doing. 70% okay. comes from doing. And now when we look at different ways of learning, there's another 70, 20, 10 baked inside of each way of learning. I see. Yeah. So, so, uh, so at the end of the day, your point is even within each type of learning, there is a doing aspect to really drive home the learnings. And I think that's what Yu Feng is asking. I haven't heard of them. And these learnings, I'm totally lost. And I think <laughs> your, your whole point is exactly that is you will not learn or to really understand you've got to figure out how to bake in some portion of doing, getting your hands dirty, if you will. Exactly, doing. And then of course, even that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, which could be a part of the original 70-20-10, right? The mentoring and coaching of 20%, that's where the social comes on this slide. And every slide is consistent in the way that it's built, but it just has different layers of how you should be looking at it. Got it, okay. Yeah. So I, I wonder if there are any questions coming. I, I did see someone had mentioned that they're not familiar with any of the learnings. <laughs> yes. So I would definitely encourage um, them to to start to look inward in their own firm or company or prerogative yeah. unless you have something for them. Yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about what micro learning looks like uh, or looked like uh, even at, uh, at your last organization? How did you, did you, was that something that you intentionally tried to drive in into just the work process of every day getting stuff done. Absolutely. So uh, even with the generations, uh, you know, as the, as the new generations start to come up, and they want the here now and let's get it over with. Mm -hmm. And so with micro learning, it's very focused. It it can be uh, two to five minutes. Just right. It focuses right on on that learning piece. And micro learning can also come off of a learning management system or an LMS. Okay. So if, if everyone that's on the call, if you're part of a company, a larger company that might already have a internal LMS system, whether it's on your phone or your laptop, they will have these shorter timed micro learnings. So it's, you're not sitting there for an hour, hour and a half or three hours. It's based on your availability. You could take it anytime you want. It could be short vignettes. Um, so I would love to be able to see even in the chat if folks have been able to take advantage of micro learning at their respective corp uh, corporations or companies. That that would be great to hear. Yeah, 
I'd love to hear that too. Pipe it in into the chat if you've if your your organization does something like this. I mean, uh, I, the first thing that topped into my mind, popped into my mind as you're talking about is you know we learn all sorts of little little things. Sometimes they're completely false, but from you know TikTok and Instagram reels and you know Facebook reels and all that type of stuff. And uh, there's obviously a whole other challenge with making sure that it's right. But you know, so many people are learning are able to you know, learn how to cook or my, my nephew, uh, learned how to, you know, play piano without ever having a piano tutor. Like I had to, when I was a kid, right. Uh, just from YouTube videos or TikToks or whatnot. And so it's a different world. And so I think this, and I hadn't thought of micro learning in that concept, but I think that's really what kind of, well, that's part of what you're getting at, I think. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it, cause micro learning includes instructional videos in that 10% formal learning like your nephew did. And, and that's phenomenal. Congratulations to him. I don't know if I could ever do that. I think I need to, again, I'm generation X. I like to be right. in person. My thing is in person, face-to-face -face learning. I think that's the way I learn uh, better. Probably, probably the way I was, I, I was brought up or grew up that way. And, um, and I see some in the, in the chat where, you know, some do have it. Uh, LinkedIn learnings. Exactly. LinkedIn is also micro learning and yeah. it, and YouTube, LinkedIn, where they're just focusing really on uh, modules or specific content. So hopefully everyone can take advantage of that. Or TED Talks, actually. That's TED Talks. Yeah. yeah, TED Talks. Absolutely. Now, what are, what are my favorite uh, coming up? I'm going to keep moving. And um, I, I love that. I love the community of practice, community of practice. And, and what that is, is if when you're when let's just take me as an example as a facilitator and so if there's a certain content that I like let's say this content a community of practice is where everyone on the call or in that room we are all on the same level we're all facilitators as an example and now we're sharing ways of presenting data or or sharing ways of having breakout sessions or sharing ways of having a, a template be completed. And that's a community of practice. So when you look at it from a 70-20-10 perspective, the 70% is sharing practical experiences and what's worked, what hasn't worked, best practices. Um, and then if you look at it from the 20%, the social, remember originally the 20% is, is mentoring and coaching. In a community of practice, the 20% is networking. So we're all in the same room, we could be on a Zoom or in the same room, the community practice, we're networking with each other, we're mentoring each other, we're being very collaborative. So we are knowledge sharing on the same topic, but different ways of facilitating it or deploying it. And the 10% for the community practice is doing a workshop. Again, we're all facilitators on the same level, and we all and we would all have access to the same resource libraries. So slowing it down, this is what a 70-20-10 in detail looks like for a community of practice. I like this because it it when you when you said community of practice, I usually think technically, but even in our world of what we're doing, um, uh, what many on this call are doing, you know, with our Asian ERGs, that's how most people on the call are here. And so even as Asian ERGs are talking about their programming um, and, you know, I know a lot of them struggle with figuring out how to get uh, professional or leadership development programming, uh, you know, incorporating some of this thinking might, you know, might add some breadth into how to approach it of a, you know, driving a dialogue to hit the 70, because usually we think about the 10, uh, but driving a dialogue to hit the 70 of just you know, sharing and sharing experiences or whatnot. Uh, one of our, uh, I know Jason Chan's on uh, from Naval Nuclear Labs, and he talked spoke with one of our prior presenters, Rebecca Okamoto, who talks about when she was getting an ERG up at her small plant in California. Um, they would, they would, uh, 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 they would figure out who has the next big presentation coming up, and they'd practice with each other, and get feedback with each other, and kind of support one another through that. And I, and I hadn't really thought about it, but this model is kind of putting it into that perspective for me is like, they didn't really have that. They weren't focusing on the 10, they were focusing on the 20 and the 70 and it's far more effective, uh, kind of exactly to your point. So, uh, yeah. I like this. this. I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's really helpful. 
Yeah, thank you, Prague. And, and I and uh, you are feel you are free to share the slides afterwards if you need to. And remember, um, just to remind everyone, the community practice comes from the original twenty percent of the right. model, the coaching and mentoring. So now, when you have a chance to look into it, and hopefully everyone can also implement the community practice in in any organization that you're a part of, or no matter what your role is. Uh, even even if you're a statistician, you know, you could do the same thing. You can have a community of practice and uh, get some big bang for the buck. And I noticed that Maritza had mentioned that she retains information better in person as well. So I'm, I am looking at the chat, um, you know, because I, I always like to have this be interactive. Uh, so there's one way. So Chan, so we, we didn't talk about uh, the best way for you to learn your, you know, your learning style, you know better what that could be. But if you think back, think back to all the different ways that you've learned, uh, whether it was in person, uh, whether during the pandemic, it was through Zoom or Teams. And then maybe if you look at your organization's learning management system, what are some of the ways that you find yourself registering for content for a class? Do you find yourself registering for in-person or for the micro learning or for maybe like the one or two hour webinars, well, you know, you should be able to answer that question. And there's no wrong answer. I always tell people, I learn better when I'm in front of people. And that's just the way yeah. I feel comfortable. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to go through some more and see if there's anything else here. Great, so Hadi, uh, try to pick up some programming skills and techniques from LinkedIn. It sounds like it worked because I didn't see a negative response on that, so. Um, Great. If, if there's nothing else, I'll just move on to the last couple slides that we have. Yep. And, and then probably leave it open to questions and answers for sure. So action learning, if, if you recall, uh, one of the ways that from the survey that came back from the poll on this call was uh, a great percentage to learn from action learning. So action learning, again, if you look at from action learning from a 70, 20, 10 perspective, just that one learning heavily focused in real world problem solving. That's the 20, that's the 70%. Hands-on, what are we getting out of action learning? We're trying to solve problems. On the job experience, we're just trying to solve the problems. We're trying to see how it aligns closely with any of the experimental component of the 70, 20, 10. And what that means, experiential, experiential. What that means is this 70 is part of the original 70. So that's the best way to correlate that. Now, even within action learning, it has a 20% component. You know, that's that mentoring coaching. And this could be on team-based problem solving. It's a group reflection. So where community of practice is a group, it's really come from each individual person. Action learning is going to be within the group by subgroups. So each, you know, so you may have three or four teams of two or three, and then each one is providing feedback on action learning uh, and through the social interactions. And then 10% is just having a structured reflection point, uh, sort of like having guided discussions of what's working, what's not working, and, and that's out of that 10% for the action learning. Any, yeah. And so I'm gonna see if there's any other numbers. Yeah, there's a new question in the chat, um, yeah. uh, which I think is a little bit broader, but you know, the numbers, are, are the 70, 20, 10, is that a measure of effectiveness or uh, or how much you get out of it or something of that nature? Is that how we ought to think about these percentages? Yeah, so, so the best way is the effectiveness and how much percentage it really takes to take out of it. So it is the effectiveness for that. Yeah, great question by BU, so. Uh, much of the 10% comes from uh, the formal, Yes, for for that uh, community practice, the the ten percent does come out of seminars and workshops. Right. Just to go back to slide, and then the last one, experiential learning. Uh, again, this is going to come from the original seventy percent, right? It's it's pretty much self explanatory, aligns directly with that component, uh, emphasizes heavy learning by doing um, and taking on real world tasks. You do have a 20% component in the experiential. So getting feedback from mentors and uh, from your peers, uh, getting feedbacks from maybe from your group discussions. And it's really enhancing your social interaction from this experiential. And then 10% is again, workshops. Now you're gonna see workshops are gonna probably be mentioned twice, but 
it's okay to even have workshops in a 10%. And it really adds a little layer of uh, formal learning uh, dimension for that. Ooh. Yeah, so in all of these, there's a formal aspect, there's a social aspect, and there's an experiential aspect. At the end of the day, I think that's kind of how you're kind of trying splitting up even within what CCL provided as far as being the examples of types of learnings, each of those even has a formal social and experiential within that. I think that's kind of what you're pushing us yeah. to think about. And no, I appreciate that. Yep. Yeah. And it's so important that all of us reflects because as we're all trying to develop ourselves and maybe become that leader within the group function or even our company, <clears throat> as Prague mentioned, we have to not be afraid to make mistakes. Let's go for it. And so what is the benefits of the 70-20-10 model? There's going to be a practical application. We have to be able to apply our knowledge directly to real world, real world scenarios. We have to be able to have practical skills and problem solving abilities. Um, the social learning aspect of it, you know, whether it's in person or in Zoom or Teams, we have to continue to interact with our peers and mentors. We have to have collaborative learning environment, collaborative learning experiences, because our interpersonal skills is really what's going to be the basis of everything we do. We mm -hmm. have to be able to interact with each other. And in the end, it's all a balanced approach. Every model provides a balanced approach, uh, you know, in that le leadership development or learning and development, because we have to have experiential, we have to have social, and we must include the formal learning methods as well for all the skills that we want to acquire. Excellent. Uh, Sandeep asked a question, does this, does this model further enhance our intelligence or, and or emotional quotient or how we relate to those, I suppose? Uh, so, how, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, leaders are made. I, I Well, that's me. There's no wrong answer. We took a poll, but I will tell you, I really strongly believe that leaders are made, whether it's we are influenced by a authority, a parental uh, figure, whether it's then going through school, you have that favorite two or three teachers and then professors as you go to university or college and then you go to work and you have that mentor, that coach. Yes, absolutely. The 70-20-10 absolutely enhances our EQ. IQ is what we've learned. A, a fantastic leader will have a high EQ. And that's really important. Um, I hope everyone knows, you know, I know it's written or emotional quotient, but it's empathy. Yeah. It's empathy, plain and simple. And um, empathy is very important, especially if you want to become a leader. The, the basis for empathy is listening. It's listening. I know I could do a better job with listening skills. If you ever have a chance to take a listening skills uh, course or content, take it. Because we can all always improve our listening skills, which goes directly into the uh, EQ. It's either that or just get married. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll hear it a few times, right? Is that what you're saying, Rod? <laughs> you better brush up on your listening skills, right? <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Uh, right now, Jessica is like shaking her head, Prague. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, let me pause. Yeah, Prague. Yeah. Uh, Huey, or uh, I apologize, H U Y. I don't know if it's Huey, Huey, or. Hi, um, but in any case, yeah. <laughs> right? They're using the three E's uh, for ten percent education, twenty percent exposure, thirty percent, uh, seventy percent experience. Those are super similar to to the uh, verbs that you were using, uh, words that you were using as well, formal, social, and experiential. Uh, so that's that's I guess that rings a little bit better. Three E's: education, exposure, experience. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Ash asks, um, what would be one question to ask? to gauge how effective a person is as a leader or their leadership? One, one, one way that I always ask about leaders is what, a couple things. Two is one, what keeps you up at night? A lot of people don't ask leaders that. Sometimes a lot of leaders don't even tell. They don't, they don't share that. But if you really want to know how effective of a leader is, ask them what keeps them up at night. Because then you're going to know that if this is keeping this leader up at night, what are they doing, saying, writing in an email or actions that you see at work? Does it match? Mm -hmm. And 90 some percent of the time, 
it will absolutely be a direct correlation to it, direct correlation. Second thing that I ask is what is your superpower? I always ask leaders whenever I come in front of them is what's your superpower? And you'll know if that superpower is aligned to being a servant leader. You absolutely want to have a servant leader, someone who puts the entire organization first, because let's face it, a leader, depending on, you know, if you're CEO, you are number, you are the salesperson number one for your company, if you're the CEO. But if you really want to know about that, about that leader or senior leader, what keeps you up at night, what's your superpower, and are they a servant leader? Are they putting me and my team first? Are they knocking down barriers uh, for us or the walls for us? So I hope that that was a great question, Ash. So thank you for asking that. If there's any other questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, um, oh, look, I don't know if this was your last slide or not. Yeah, yeah. I, I just had one more. Uh, in case anyone wants to get in touch with me, I can do that now or later. It's your, yeah, it's your go call. ahead and do that now, and then we'll yeah. just kind of go into side by side mode. Uh, let right. folks uh, scan that. Go ahead and like. Uh, you know, yeah, add, go ahead. add a look to your LinkedIn and yeah, we'll just have a little bit of a chat on learning in general, because I, I, I want to poke your brain a little bit more because, and I'm probably going to ask them questions or that kind of delve into your, uh, uh, into your, into your more recent history at a corporation about, you know, L and D in general, like, uh, how, what's been your under, what's been your learning on, or, uh, a, a, a special, you know, Approaches to leadership development versus technical skills, right? I feel like for technical skills, it is easier to, or it it's more acceptable, I guess, or more if there's more effectiveness behind the uh, behind the classroom learning, behind the book learning, whatnot, like that. And I've always thought of it as being okay. The book learning is totally fine for for more of the you know equations and technical skill, but for leadership development that's a lot softer, right? And so book learning won't get you very far. And so I've always thought of those as being very different in, as far as approach, but I wonder if I might be not thinking about it correctly. And I'd love to kind of get your perspective on that. Do you think the type of learning matters as far as how to apply 70-20-10? I, I definitely think, um, excuse me, I'm gonna take a, let me take a little sip here. Yeah, no problem. I definitely think that the type of learning does matter, but the way that I look at it is, uh, for technical skills, depending on what your role is, that's really on the individual le level. You're, you're really learning it yourself. And now it's up to you to go and apply it. With leadership development, it's about the ability to interact with others. It's the true soft skills. So with leadership development, it could be if you're a first-time people manager. All right, well, how do you handle your team? You, it's not really telling them what to do. It's about providing feedback. It's, per, it's, it's about giving them a little bit of um, space to make, make mistakes and to learn and coaching. So again, technical skills, it's what I'm going to learn and apply for my job. Leadership development, what I'm going to learn and be able to interact with others, my team, or even senior leaders, or even, you know, two or three levels down. And that's the, really the biggest difference for me. Okay. Okay. I need to do that digest that a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, it's what you are applying your efforts toward, um, and that's really what changes the dynamic of how. Okay, uh, you know, I I bring this up because uh, a lot of our programs are, you know, webinars like this or workshops or whatnot, and a lot of them are kind of one and done, right? Uh -huh. Because because we're not integrated with organizations, and the experiential aspect of it, there's only so much you can do within a webinar, certainly within an in-person workshop or a virtual workshop, there's only so much you can do before and uh, before you can uh, to, be, be, you know, before the, the session ends. And, uh, and so when you've worked, when you've led these types of programs in the past, um, you know, how would you, how, how should we be thinking about the, you know, if you go to a workshop, how how should we think be thinking about the actual learning period on making a new habit or making putting something into practice or, you know, what advice can you give us on that front? Yeah. So, Prague, if I understand correctly, is you go in, uh, whether it's online or, or in face to face, and then you, you are exposed to some new content. 
And so what is that teach back period or application period? Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, studies have shown you really want to bring it back and apply it within two to three days. Okay. Two to three days. Otherwise, if you go back to your office or your desk and you start pounding out those emails and start doing things and then two days go by, chances are you're going to forget half the things that you learned. You really have to apply it as soon as you can. One of the things that I tell um, folks that go through my training is in advance, talk to your managers, talk to your teammates and let them know that you're going to be sitting through learning X, Y, Z, or even this 70, 20, 10, and be able to say to them in advance, hey, I'm doing this on Tuesday, the 6th of August. Can I do a teach back during our staff meeting, which is the next day of August 7th or maybe the August 8th, latest of Friday, August 9th? Do a teach back. Mm -hmm. Let them know everything that you learned. And but don't make it into a teacher moment. Make it collaborative. What does everybody think about this? You know, what, what would your 70, 20, 10 look like? Is there anything in here you don't agree with? It's okay. What I presented is um, content that has worked, but it, it doesn't mean that it's the only 70, 20, 10. That's what I would recommend, Parag. Teach back. Yeah, that's a great comment. Gene just echoed you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, you. I think that's spot on uh, is finding, because it, there's an accountability aspect there as well, right? Um, yeah. And I feel like, you know, uh, before I knew better, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> if I were to, I'd tell myself, "Hey, I got to teach this back." Now I'm, get, I, 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 I think that would freak me out because I'd be feel like, "Okay, I can't teach back unless I'm an expert in this," and that's impossible. That's it's impossible to for for me to even even right now uh, teach the seventy twenty ten tomorrow. It'd be impossible to teach it perfectly as much as you are able to. But instead, if I approach it a little bit differently to be more of a, hey, I'm going to share what I learned and let's just have a conversation about it. I'm Some of what I learned, I may have misheard it or I may have misunderstood it and really kind of approach it a little bit looser, <laughs> I think is yeah. kind of what you're getting at. Absolutely. And, you know, thank you, Gene and Sandeep. You're right. Keep it as simple as possible. And Prague, if you, if you want to take it a step further, teach back could be the 20 percent of the okay. 70 20 10 yep you're going back and you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring your coach to your team or wherever it might be that's the you are going back and even though you're going to teach the entire content that's your 20 percent yeah and keep it simple yeah then what about 70 how would you recommend them putting the 70 in place or what does that uh, you know, whatever the content is, how, you know, there's still the aspect of remembering it, but you still got to act on it, right? You still got to act on it. And especially with, uh, you know, soft skills, uh, we've got to come up with a better word for that. But you know, especially with soft <laughs> skills, I think, I think I heard critical skills, somebody called it that and said, which is very true. Uh, yeah, like, what would you recommend for, you know, what do you recommend to, you know, folks back uh, uh, mm -hmm. when, when you've coached them on how to actually put just, something just in go do it. You know, another thing that I heard is human skills. So I've, I've started to hear instead of soft skills, I've started to hear human skills. Human skills. That's really what it is. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you're interacting. So even if you do a teach back on the 70, 20, 10 of what you've learned, now it's just a matter of doing. Now you're, you're, you're going back to your team and you're saying, look, this is what I learned. Let's go do it. Let's go learn each of the 70, 20, 10. Let's jump on the LMS system. Let's try to expand our knowledge. Let's learn about what an elevator pitch is, as an example, or how to give effective feedback. Yeah. Right. How do we do that? Let's just start doing that. So yeah, that's, that's a great example, actually, because you're going to be doing giving and giving or receiving feedback at the conference, right? At our conference in October. Yeah. So even there, you know, when you tell the group of however many people, hey, you've got to put this into practice, um, you know, uh, their manager is not in the room with them uh, or their support in this, depending on whichever, or their peers, whoever they're giving and receiving feedback. How would you in that scenario uh, help them get over this uh, hump of how do I put this into practice and potentially get it wrong, right? And, and this is for the feedback portion, right, Prof? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Exactly. So when, when we're when we do this in October and we're going to have a table setting and everyone at the table, you know, that'll be that 20 percent of it. But it's really going to be doing. So right. what we're going to what I'm going to present to the room is going to be actionable. 
is they're going to have a template in front of them, a piece of paper, and they're going to be able to draw out, write out how to give effective feedback on a certain situation. Okay. And then be able to exchange ideas, be able to have that community of practice at each table. They're now bouncing the uh, the star model off of each other and getting feedback on how to make it better and effective feedback. Because everything we do, it has to be actionable. It has to be actionable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's also... Um talking about the national conference potentially too much. <laughs> but uh that's you know it it's exactly what we why we make our sessions longer is to enable that um uh the social aspect you know there's what's on the screen which is the 10 percent the social aspect which is the group learning and then this and 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 gets into the experiential as well um but also then you know what tool are you taking away to be able to actually put this into practice and uh i like your comment about you know talk with your team in advance so uh and it's something that i'm trying to figure out how to do as well is before you come to a conference ours or somebody else's go through the agenda with your manager talk through which sessions are important and uh yeah you're going to go to you know six to eight sessions that are conference which is too much but pick at least a handful that you really want to zero in on and drive that conversation with if you don't feel comfortable with your manager then appear that you uh respect and figure out how to put stuff into practice uh, absolutely Prague, the e and the easiest way to do that is for all the folks who will be attending the conference 99 percent, you probably already have approval or authorize authorization to do so Right. Yeah. So that's a perfect segue to say, hey, look, I'm going to be going and I would love to be able to touch base on the following Tuesday about what I've learned. And, you know, and I want to be able to bring it back. So it's it's actually an easy ask. It's an easy ask. I did have one more one more question I wanted to ask the whole group. Oh, yeah. Of, of the 70 2010, that 20 percent is coaching and mentorship. Oh uh, yeah, so Lucas asked a great question. So if, if <laughs> you want to give that information, I will at the end. Thanks, Lucas. Like Seventy twenty ten. Twenty percent is mentors and coaches. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to see whether it's in the chat or by hands. Does everyone have a mentor? I top it, top toss it into the uh, chat as well if you want. Yes, no, or so thank you, Matthew, hand. Lucas. I think I saw. Yeah. Because, yes, multiple. Great and and. Okay, so Joanne, I see uh, Joanne, no. I see a no. Vikram, Vikram, Randy, George. So look, mm -hmm. for the 70 20 10 model to work for everyone, get a mentor. And 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 that, and that could be a discussion for another day, it could take another couple hours, but I will tell you that if you look at it from the easiest perspective, a mentor doesn't have to be top down. It doesn't have to be a senior leader and then you. It could be your peer. It could be somebody on your team. It could be peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, but everybody has to have a mentor, um, not a coach. Coaches are nice to have, but for everyone on here, uh, okay, Maritza, yeah, good. You're actively looking. Hope, do it. Keep looking, but find that mentor. And mentorship doesn't isn't always top down. By the way, mentoring mentorship is also bottom up. It's also the other uh, the reverse way. So for the 70, 20, 10 to work for everyone, you have to have a mentor in that, in that 20%. I think the, I feel like the critical piece there is trust. Who do you trust to actually talk with, like to vent, to open up to, be vulnerable about and get perspective that you really believe in? And uh, yeah, I at least in my career, I found that usually I developed pretty solid rapports with whoever I was reporting to. And then uh, I had to remind myself to stay in touch with them <laughs> and yeah. to use them as a mentor ongoing and and whatnot because sometimes just my personality type is like okay i'm over here now i'm focusing on this and i forgot about everything over here but i'd have to remind myself to maintain those types of relationships and those were the ones that ended up being my mentors more often than not is former managers it, it, exactly and <clears throat> you hit it on the nail um it's about a former manager so while while coella is asking the manager for potential mentor which is great try not it don't have your manager be your mentor have a former manager be your mentor and one last piece on the mentors you don't need to have one what i like to call a board of mentors or a board of directors it's okay to have five of them four or five of them and it's also okay to switch them out every six months because it will run its course 
again, I know it's a whole new topic for another day, <laughs> but that 20%, you absolutely need, should have a mentor. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I had a different question that I wanted to ask, but I forgot. Sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, here's one. How about in the chat, Richard? So Richard doesn't have a mentor, but he's mentoring. Great. Great. Yeah. You know, your next step would be to get one. Ken, thank you. Yeah, I just presented that on uh, last week, Board of Mentors. Uh, absolutely. Switch them out as you need to. Um, how do you get a mentor? Jo Joni, you can find a mentor at a next conference, um, you know, within your industry or what you what you do. Uh, that's actually the best way is to find someone who's within somebody you can trust, like Prague mentioned, somebody yeah. you hit it off with. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, can I ask you a question? You know, that's how you would get one. Exactly. Spot on. Um, you know, as we uh, in in your own uh, uh, practice, actually say a little bit more about what you do with your practice now, because you just kind of are going full time now more recently. What is it that you re actually like drives and motivates you mo moving into your consulting and coaching business? Yeah. So, th so thank you, Prague. So um, I did exit from Santa Fe after 21 years. And I love what I did with leadership development. What, what One thing I found is that when I was probably everyone's age, because probably half my age, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a champion. I didn't have a sponsor, or at least I didn't think I did, because it wasn't really prevalent. It wasn't in front of me. And and I made a lot of mistakes. And I, I, I'm just giving back. I would love to give back to everyone. And that's really what I'm doing is I created my own uh, company and is really consulting senior leadership at other life sciences. And that's my sweet spot, life sciences. And it's also mentoring university students, uh, even young Asian professionals in the workforce, just mentoring and coaching, uh, bouncing ideas or allowing them to bounce ideas off of me. But that's really what I'm doing is I'm trying to give back as much as I can. Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm going to put you semi on the spot and I apologize if this backfires on me, but uh, you know, I know you've got kids as well uh, and who are now in school and whatnot. And um, have you changed your parenting style versus your own parents based off of what you learned in corporate America or what, what it takes to, it takes to succeed in how you, uh, and it did that translate somehow into how you approach your own, you know, parenting style? Yeah, great, great question, Parag. So my parents, um, my dad, highly educated, Yale University, came over in 1960. So you can imagine type A, bam, 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 first gen. Uh, growing up, it was more like you can do this or no, 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 no. With with us, what I find with me specifically, so my oldest daughter is in law school, University of Miami, Florida, and the younger one of the two is in Rutgers Business School. What I found that worked for me and for them is try it. Just go do it. If you fail, it's okay. I think I shocked all my friends when I just let them come home with a C or a D on a report card. That's like typically, you know, being Indian, if you get a B, it's like an F. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. A report card does not define you, right? Now, it, everybody's probably wondering, okay, well, what was my GPA? It was not a 4.0, so maybe that's why I can do that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that's why. But yes, it, it absolutely, um, uh, my relationship with my daughters, knock on wood, I, I, I'd like to think it's because of what I learned uh, through corporate America. It's everybody needs to have space. Everyone needs to have the ability to make mistakes. Everybody needs to have the ability to learn from the mistakes. And your children or your parents are no different. Remember, your parents are parents for the first time too. They're going through this the first time as well, being your parents. Very true. Thank right? you so much, Alok. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, you know, uh, uh, well, you might shoot me afterwards, but uh, fantastic <laughs> answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, I thought it would be especially poignant coming from someone who does L&D for a living. Right. And, you know, what has kind of been the biggest thing? And it's the ex the the em embracing of mistakes and embracing of failure as a uh, as a as an opportunity to learn versus that shame piece. And it kind of goes back to the aversion to risk, uh, which I often feel like is out of the four that I'd mentioned at the very beginning. I feel like that's the biggest one is that aversion to risk. And so I, 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 I love that you 
more or less kind of you kind of picked that one out too so <laughs> so hey we are at the you know we're we're right at the end here um oh, look thank you so much jessica okay. if you could toss in the uh the poll we've got a quick poll for folks just on our overall program three questions just scroll down uh and answer all three of them and i can see my screen now so we will uh, uh let's see uh so yeah if you can answer those three, that would be super helpful for us. Make sure that we are, you know, delivering value to you. Uh, and our next one, you can go to the webinar, uh, the, our webinar page, saysmac.org backslash, backslash webinar. Uh, totally different type of content next month is uh, with Kyla Zhao, who came from the fashion industry and then went to, to Silicon Valley and ended up writing a handful of books through the pandemic. A uh, wonderful young lady with a fantastic perspective. Uh, you know, uh, immigrating over from Singapore and um, whatnot. I, it's a, it'll be a super interesting conversation. And then, uh, you know, uh, 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 as a special, uh, you know, special gift, we will have some book giveaways as well with that. So you won't want to miss that one. Uh, you can follow us on the web on, uh, you know, you can look at us at saysonac.org backslash pro or follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we post everything there. Uh, as Lucas was asking, what's this national convention thing that you guys are talking about? Um, well, uh, our national convention is our big event every year. Uh, yes, that is the back of my head. Uh, I did not, I did not choose that picture, the marketing team at say <laughs> for us but um yeah apparently the glare wasn't too distracting but we'll be up in the in boston at the uh, boston convention expedition center for two and a half days sponsored by these four wonderful companies what is it uh, it is we should be close to a thousand professional we sold over 600 tickets right now we've got uh well over 100 executives on their way 2500 students 100 companies lots of interactive workshops highly interactive workshops. The shortest session is 60 minutes. The long sessions are two and a half hours. Uh, that sounds like it'd be insanely boring, but they are not. We keep lots of different tracks. So it's not a thousand people in a room, it's a hundred people in a room and round tables. So you will get practice at all this type of stuff and actually put the 70-20-10 model into practice in each of those sessions. Registration is 1,050, half of that goes to food. So this is not a high margin type of endeavor. Uh, if you want to see a little bit about what we got Wednesday night, but then also our keynotes, Jane Hun, who uh, coined the term bamboo ceiling and wrote the bamboo ceiling book, along with a follow up book, she'll be keynoting on Wednesday night. Lan Fan, who is Community 7, as well as Do This Daily, a podcast that has quite a large following, will be doing Thursday morning. My friend Rajiv Satyal is a comedian, stand up comedian, former uh, a former marketer at Procter & Gamble. He'll be emceeing. On Thursday, this is an eye chart, but this is what our program looks like. You will be mentally exhausted, and that's a good thing. Um, that's all day Thursday, all day Friday. Everything you can see here will be on our website, saysonek.org. Go to the convention website. Some of our trainers. Uh, we've got 10 fantastic Asian heritage trainers who do this for a living. And not only that, we've got 10 more on top of that. So there are 20 trainers plus those three speakers, each of which who are also doing workshops. This thing's going to be insane. So uh, uh, highly recommend if you can get your company to sponsor you to go over there. If you cannot get your company, we do have a handful of volunteer slots available. We can't cover your travel, but we could cover it. We can get you complimentary registration if you volunteer. If you're interested in that, reach out to us at pro at saceconnect.org. You will be working, but you will be able to get content as well. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Really greatly appreciate it. A look. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the conversation with you. Uh, had a great time and really looking forward to chatting with you in Boston in October. So thanks, everyone.